evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We can stand for the pledge. Phil, would you lead us off on the pledge? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And a moment of silence for all our service men and women fighting ISIS and other terrorists abroad and at home. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And I just want to say quickly thank you to Tom Hackert. He is our Paul Revere. He went around the whole neighborhood in Whitestone delivering flyers, getting the word out. And we wish that we had more people here, but it's not in vain because we're still going to learn and meet great candidates and go out and spread the information we learn here to our family, our friends, and our neighbors. So thank you, Tom, so much. And we're still going to keep fighting. I don't care. So I would like to introduce Lawrence Winberry. He's the host for tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome to tonight's uh, event for the Northeast Queens Tea Party Patriots. Lauren is the organizer and she uh, works tirelessly to uh, make these events happen and do other things for us. So let's give a round of applause, please. Lord. And also I'd like to, uh, we should thank uh, Mr. Ferrara, Michael Ferrara, who's running the video camera for the food tonight. All delicious food. And I have a personal note. Uh, I just would like to mention that uh, it's always, uh, I've been in the Tea Party movement for a few years now, since it started basically, back to its origins, 2009. And it's very uh, personal with me now that I'm involved with this particular Tea Party, Northeast Queens, because uh, my family is from Whitestone. My father grew up near the corner of 17th Avenue, 149th Street, so you could basically walk there from here. So uh, Whitestone's in my roots, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very happy to be here, and today happens to be my father's birthday, he would have been 89 today, and how do I know that? His twin brother, my uncle Edward, turned 89 today. We celebrated earlier today, so it's a very important day for me. Okay, so uh, I'd like to get things started. Um, uh, a friend of mine is here tonight. Oh, we have another guest? Okay, good. Um, as you know, the Tea Party movement is, uh, you know, one of grassroots, right? Now, we know, we all know that our enemies, and we do have them, political enemies, like Nancy Pelosi, right? Yeah, she likes to call us AstroTurf. You know, that's her uh, demeanor, the meaning uh, way to describe us. But she's got it 100% wrong. You know, we are the opposite of that. We are the most genuine grassroots movement you will ever come across. Think about who's here tonight. Turn to your right and left and think of people that you know or you're meeting tonight. These, we are all just, what, everyday people who care about our country and we're watching it going way in the wrong direction. And everything with regards to big government and programs that run people's lives and Obamacare and all these things that where government is getting power. And I listen to Dennis Prager. Any Dennis Prager listeners here tonight? He runs a radio show and he says that what's well, true. Anytime the government gains more power, we lose some. It's a zero-sum game, okay? So everything that we stand, we believe in is what's being uh, destroyed, and that's why you're here tonight, and that's why we keep going, Tea Party, despite all the negative and lying that goes on about negative uh, characterization of our movement. We know what we are. We know that we're decent, honorable people out to make a difference and stop the uh, destruction of the American uh, nation in terms of the values that made it great all, for all the centuries that's been around. And we're gonna try to keep working to reverse the negative trend that's been going on. And so as part of that, I was uh, uh, doing you know, one of the many uh, things that Tea Party used to do, we gather, and I met a man uh, who's here tonight, and his name is Kevin Barrett, 
and he's from uh, well, he's born around here, but he's from the Catskills. I learned he grew up there, but now he's a New Yorker again, and he lives in Harlem, and he had the guts to run for the New York State Senate from that important district, and he'll tell you all about it, but I'm very proud to call him my friend. Please give a welcome to Mr. Kevin Barrett. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, um, usually I have a lot of notes in my head that I want to speak about and have some ideas. But today, tonight, I just want to express myself about some things that are going on here locally in our city and things going on in our state and things going on in our country. Um, I have to tell you that I'm very comfortable here. I'm very comfortable in a space like this because I grew up in a... In a, in a I, I was born in Manhattan in Lenox Hill Hospital, right on the Upper East Side. Anybody else, you know, have any co-pack, co -pack? There you go. No, I, I worked there 40 years. You worked there 40 years? Yeah, but you guys didn't know. Okay, I don't know. You're young. Maybe you, maybe you remember me coming out of the uh, shoot. <laughs> um, but I, I grew up in, in upstate New York and um, in a very small village called Bloomingburg, New York. And um, in, I, in my little village, we had just maybe 300 and some odd people there, and they were all a community. And I want to talk about community. I want to talk about these things that brought me to this point, to be here in this particular space and to be talking, have the honor and privilege of talking to everybody here. When I was a little kid, we had the, the Memorial Day Parade, you know? When people came out to the Memorial Day Parade, and I was a little kid, and I was the only African-American little kid in my home community, but I didn't know the difference at that point. And I don't really felt to think I even really know the difference when I got into high school. Well, I'm kind of deluding myself. Yes, I did. But I was a part of the community. In fact, I was a leader in the community. And I was a little kid sitting in the, the, the uh, Memorial Hall, which was designed for Memorial Day and to honor the veterans. And here were the, the signs of the World War I veterans and the Civil War veterans that came from our little village. And they were singing the Battle Hymn of Republic. I can still place myself there. I can still place myself in New York State. I was a member of the Junior Grange. Remember the Grange? I don't know if you had one here in Queens. The Grange was an organization that started in the turn of the century to help farmers. They were lobbyists to help farmers in New York State to get electricity for their barns so they could be more effective and more efficient. And I was a member of that organization and through the Grange, I uh, would travel and I became involved in the talent shows. And I would travel to different fairs. I'm sorry. I'm usually, I usually, my voice carries, but if you need me here, I'll do this. Is that better? Okay. And I, and I don't want to blast you out because my voice can come out. Um, wow. So I would be in these affairs and I'd go to fairs and I'd sing. I, I remember a little kid, I had a top hat and I was singing Hello Dolly all over New York State. We'd go to Casanova upstate. We'd go to, uh, up to Plattsburgh. We would go down to Dutchess County and, the, and to the Poughkeepsie area. And I had my, my moment about 15 minutes of fame when I was a young kid and I sang for Governor Rockefeller in Chancellor Hall in Albany, New York. Now, I wasn't supposed to sing for him, but I got up there to sing my piece for this whole audience of people and the governor happened to arrive at that time. And I had a picture taken with him by some photographer there, but, you know, it's a long time gone. I was in Boy Scouts. Any Boy Scouts here? Eagle Scouts? Remember Boy Scouts? Okay, I was in Boy Scouts, and I was, went through the, the, the ranks there from, from, my mom was a den mom in Cubs and Weeblos and to Boy Scouts. And I remember being, uh, later on in life, being on a board of education and having to fight to keep the Boy Scouts in our school. Because I was one of nine people on the board, and they were deciding to make some kind of law. Remember when they were saying that they were discriminating and everything? Um, to keep the Boy Scouts in the school, and I went one against nine, eight other people, and I managed to get 300 Boy Scouts to show up at the next meeting and keep Boy Scouts in our school. So, but, but back to these memories. 4-H, is there a 4-H's around here? You remember 4-H? It's like, it's like ancient history to some people because kids don't get that. They don't get that community. So when I'm in a room like this, attached to a church, this is an activity center. This is a place where young kids that were here earlier were learning how to do karate and do and self-defense and things like that. 
And this is where all of us come from, right? This is where our roots are as American people, the small organizations that make us who we are. Now, I, I ran into Lawrence at a very interesting event, at a Republican event up in uh, East Harlem. It was at the Ricardo's, and it was uh, Ed Cox, the chairman, was there, and all these people. And, you know, I had this affinity towards the Tea Party because of my background. Because, number one, my father was a Republican, my grandfather was a Republican. In my little village, if you weren't a Republican, you didn't, have to, you, you didn't know what was going on. So, because the Republicans controlled everything. But my mom was a Democrat, so I guess I'm a bi-political child, something like that. And my mother being um, a Democrat, she was in the, in the McGovern race, and I remember going with her to the events that she was involved in. I remember going to the events that my father was involved with. But the, the, uh, the political structure was that. So I have been a conservative since I was very young, because I followed my father's path. I was taken in by books by, by Anne Rand, I love William F. Buckley. I love the thinking process that makes one a conservative mind. It's simply a matter of logic. So I have this affinity towards the Tea Party. So I come to New York, and here is Lawrence and some other people. And I'm on 112th Street and 2nd Avenue, and they said, oh, we're part of the Tea Party. Tea Party in Manhattan? What, are you kidding me? So it was the Gotham Tea Party, and so I started going to the meetings, and I started getting involved, and I started coming to help make phone calls to help people to get involved. And uh, the Tea Party, I have that affinity because for 10 years, I was the city historian of a city called Newburgh, New York. And Newburgh, New York is the, the, the birthplace of our republic. In Newburgh, New York, George Washington uh, ended the, the Revolutionary War, he gave out the first uh, uh, purple heart, and he claimed, he, he decided not to be a king. I don't know if you know that, but one of the generals told him, oh, you know, you would make a great king. And he said, banish the thought. That's a very important word coming out of a person's mouth at that time. Banish the thought. And then, God forbid, it meant, that I would be take and be a tyrant, a, a, a tyrant over the people that we just tried to fight to get away, get, get out of our country. So, Newburgh has a lot of history, and I know the history of our country just by Newburgh, by, by writing a book about Newburgh, and writing a book about the house, the Hasbrook House, or Washington's last headquarters, where he did finally do all those three things. I also have this affinity towards music, and I sing opera, and recently, um, may I have a glass of water or something? Um, thank you. And, and recently, I was uh, at another Tea Party event. I met a young man named uh, Matthew Zachary Johnson. Remember that name, M. Zachary Johnson. He is, without a doubt, going to be the next Aaron Copeland of our, of our, of our, of our time. And um, I didn't think too much of it. He asked me to come over to audition or to, to sing with him. Next thing I know, he has me in a show. And we just finished it about a month ago at the Fringe, um, Fringe Festival. And it's called the Boston Tea Party Opera. <laughs> we don't have enough history and positive things being expressed to our children. We don't have enough of our heritage and our culture being expressed to our children. We have everything but. If you'd said tea party, people would go, they, they can't stand it. And he put together an opera, a beautiful opera, and expressed our history. And people were there like amazed about how, how great this history was, about how um, you know, the Boston Massacre occurred in the Boston Tea Party and we got rid of King George. It was, it was exciting. And I was happy to be a part of that small opera and the debut of that particular opera. I wasn't happy to become a, a British general. That's because I was a British officer and I had to kill Americans. But it's the theater, right? So, in fact, I had to kill Crispus Attucks. Do you know who that is? But it was a great show. And there's one piece in the show that you will understand very well. At the end of the opera, 
I play this, this British officer and I let go of the keys so that they can take the tea out of the, out of the boat. And Paul Revere sings this song. And I want to sing it to you. I know politicians don't sing, but I'm going to sing. <laughs> when the government subjects a people to a power which is arbitrary, then to cast off the injustice is their right, their right and their necessity. Now, if you listen to those words, and you, you hear those words impactful in a show, imagine 15 New York Times liberal reviewers in the audience. <laughs> they were there. And after one show, we had to go out and talk to them, and they asked questions about the opera and everything. And at the end, one guy says, um, and I, I heard him say, his thinking, his mind is coming out, he says, um, uh, he's talking to the director, do you think you'll have any trouble calling it the Boston Tea Party Opera? Because opera is such a funny word, I mean, it's such an old, distant word. How about you call it the musical? And when he was finished, I said, I raised my hand, sir, I thought you were going to have a problem with the Boston Tea Party. And he said, oh, no, no, no problem with that. But I know there would be a problem because the Tea Party and what it means and being a member of it is almost like you, we're, we're under attack. And that's not right. That's not America. It's not America to have the IRS to be on our backs and to be looking into our background. It's not right. So, I'm very, I'm very proud to be at home with people who care about our Constitution, who care about the things in our community. And it may be in the past and have that memories of those things in the past, but I really believe that it can be in the future. I'm running in this, in this, uh, this district, uh, the 29th district for Senate. Um, my district includes South Bronx, East Harlem, a little bit of Carnegie Hill in Manhattan, over the whole of Central Park, and all the way over to the on, the, on the Upper West Side, all the way to the river, to the Hudson River. Very diverse district. Econo socioeconomically, racially, religiously, everywhere. And my opponent is named Jose Serrano. He's the son of, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. He's the son of a congressman. <laughs> That's better, right? He's a son of a congressman. And you know how that nepotism works and how those things, you, like you're either a Clinton or a Cuomo or a Kennedy, well that's the long past, but he's a Serrano. And he doesn't have to do much. The whole district is eight to one Democrat to Republican. And his nickname is Casper the Friendly Ghost. Everybody you talk to, oh, you mean Casper? And Casper the Friendly Ghost is, is, has that nickname because he's a short enough friendly guy, but he's invisible. He's not in the community. He doesn't go to any events. He sits there and collects a check, and because he's been there 10 years and has done nothing, no one's expecting anything from him. I've stopped people in the street and I said, I'm running for, oh, I don't like politicians. I said, well, why don't you like politicians? Because they never answer their phones. They never do anything for you. They're, I said, well, I'm running against Jose Serrano. That's the exact guy who doesn't do anything. So even a Democrat, hopefully, would be able to give support because they don't like this particular person. I'm running because I have a background in public service. I've been on a board of education in a community that was divided racially at one time and had to have this, the federal government to come to step in. I'm, my background is in education because I've been the president of two statewide organizations. One of my things I want to talk about in my community is education, Common Core, and the, and the fact that that is a very disastrous program. They don't feel it as much because their educational environment is a disaster to begin with. Public schools are in trouble. And I'm very much supportive of charter schools because I think there are people in those communities who need to have that that ability to go, they can't afford private school, but if they, they love their children so much that they want to have a little bit more for them, God bless them and there should be charter schools and they should be funded and they should be helped along the way. <laughs> Another thing I've seen in, my, in the schools and walking around where I've been in my little community is that 
everybody, I was up in uh, near Car uh, Cardinal Spellman in, in the Bronx up there, and uh, another school that was looked like a project. It's a terrible thing that people and young people, African American, Hispanic, and white, are living in projects. And then they leave their projects, their concrete, and they go to a school building which looks like a project. So I'm thinking that what could be done to make, to change their, their, their mindset and their, their lifestyles? And I thought that uniforms for public schools is a good idea. Yes. Because it would take away, it would take away all this like, hats backwards, pants down, and, and give them a reason, okay, you're going to school, this is like, when you go to a party, you dress this way. When you go to a wedding, you dress this way. When you go to school, you dress this way. Not you come to school with the clothes that you slept in, because they do come in their, in their night clothes. In fact, some schools have a problem, oh yeah, it's pajama day. Everybody's running around with pajamas on. I mean, so these are things that, two things that I would like to be able to talk about on the trail for about education. Also, affordable housing. I happen to be on the HOPE board, which is a HOPE community in, in East Harlem, and it's, I'm the treasurer there, and we deal with issues of affordable housing. And uh, the program, this organization has been 40 years there trying to help in this community. We have a lot of properties, a lot of vacant apartments, and uh, we do do a lot of good things there. And I'm happy to be a part of that organization and happy to be a, a, a proponent of affordable housing. I happen to be also a real estate broker and I see the changes that are happening in, in these areas. The South Bronx is now coming up alive. There's a Sobro Economic Development Corporation there. They're making changes down to the rivers, uh, the, 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 by, the, uh, by the river and the bay. And they're doing a lot of positive things in the South Bronx. You know, you've seen areas like um, uh, Long Island City, which is Queens, you should be familiar with that, that's exploded and changed. Uh, Williamsburg changed. Red Hook, I remember when I was a kid, we, my, my relatives, cousins, they lived in a project over in Red Hook. And I was like nine years old, coming from corn-fed, cow-milking, Orange County, New York, and I was like, wow, this is what life is on another place, in another world. And, uh, but now, Red Hook, you can't even barely afford a place down here. So, the Bronx is coming back. East Harlem is coming back. It needs, uh, the people in these communities who are there, our locals, feel they're being pushed out. Because there is a lot of more money coming into the area. And as I always say to them, it's not gentrification, it's called development. And if you're not ready for it, it will pass you by. So I try to get out there and tell people to get ready for the changes that are happening so that they can maintain themselves there and we can have some affordable housing to stay there. To end, I just wanted to, uh, to just share with you, I don't know how much more I could share, I sang for you, I, I'm not gonna dance, um, but uh, just share some of my ideas, I mean, we, we, about where we're at. I mean, a lot of people are, are worried about the enemy without. And there is an enemy without. On the other side of the ocean, on the other side of wherever we consider out. But I just wanted to talk about, just briefly, the enemy within. And if we don't keep our focus on the enemy within, the one that teaches our kids, the ones in the thought processes and the, and the television. You know, I have a daughter, she's 15 years old. I said, you know, I'm gonna run for state senate and she's seen me run before. I ran in Newburgh, New York for county legislature. And she says, daddy, that's great. I said, yeah, I think it is too. And she says, but, but, I said, what do you mean, but? But, do you have to run as a Republican? <laughs> I said, well, my daughter is very liberal, unfortunately, but it's the system. And it's the thought process. Even if she weren't, everything is against us. And we have to change that dynamic and change it through things like the Boston Tea Party opera, where we're writing pieces about our history and, 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 uh, and, and the glorious history that this country has had. Despite all the negatives, despite, you know, 
uh, the things such as na slavery and, and, and rights issues and people that, and things that have come up. This is the only country that has, could, could correct itself. Go to another country, go to any place in Europe or any place. If you're a person who was discriminated against, you'll be discriminated against for the next 150 years. <laughs> this is a country that allows for people to be able to come up and to, and to heal itself and to change itself. I was the director of a human rights commission for three years where I had to look into cases of discrimination all over my county and be responsible for keeping good harmony and good relations between people. And I did it. But as I said, think about the situations we have in, within our society. Our children. 35% of our young girls are pregnant by the time they reach the age of 19. 50% of our young African American, Hispanic young men do not go out of, get out of high school. We have problems within us. And I know that it's, 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 we're concerned about other things, but we need to just reflect of where we are, who we are, and what we can immediately change around us and, pause and do some positive actions, as I said, like the Boston Tea Party Opera or anything to expose people to the thinking that is conservative and will always be. Thank you. How about a round of applause, Mr. Kevin Barrett? Um, I wanted to uh, say, I guess it's the first time you've had any singing done uh, at one of your events, so thanks for that, sir. And uh, before any of the questions, I can ensure that we get this out there. Uh, you do a website, do you not? Yes, I do. It's on my thing, www.electkevinbarrett.com. Okay, and I assume you take donations. No. <laughs> yes, I do. So uh, please feel free if you like what you heard. Uh, I always say this about when I, for example, I was helping support uh, Steve Lonigan in New Jersey, even not from New Jersey. But guess what? A senator is a senator. The Senate affects all of us in this country. In the same manner, the state Senate affects the whole state. And so Mr. Barrett may not be from around here, but if he wins and gets into the state Senate, he'll have a voice for people like us who believe in things that we believe in in the state senate, so please keep that in mind when you're thinking about you know, supporting him for his race. And once again, I want to congratulate him on the, on the courage it takes to do it in the district he's in. Anyway, uh, so questions for Mr. Barrett? Any questions? Go ahead. Sir. I'm a uh, retired shop teacher. Technology now, but actually shop teacher. And it's still in the ranks 100 but they're not teaching shop anywhere. The kids are just exposed to reading and all, um, all of the academic subjects. They've lost that impetus to, uh, to explore, to explore the world, etc. It fits in with what you were saying. The idea of being able to uh, develop themselves more, to become more individualistic, to, to become, have a, uh, their own businesses, maybe. To use their hands, yes. to manufacture, to be a craftsman, to be, a, to be able to use your hands for more than just going dig, 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 on a game. Exactly. Right. I, I mean, you talk of, I mean, thank God your teacher, your shop teacher, I remember my shop teacher. His name was Mr. Lauer, Pine Bush, New York. He was a Marine. He had that haircut that was all the way straight back like this and that flat top, and he was very rugged. I remember the first thing he would tell us. He says, don't cut your hands on my saws, because your blood will rust my blades. <laughs> and we didn't cut our hands. But, um, right, you're right. There, there is a tremendous need for vocational education. I mean, not everybody, some of these kids are in school that are learning, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, uh, are, are need that. But not all of them are gonna go to college. But all of them have the ability to do something that's functional. Sometimes, I mean, I've been in politics a long time. I, 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 I didn't go to both seats. I, I went to college and went and finished my education and, and I was that direction. 
But you know, at my age right now, sometimes I wish I uh, knew how to cut hair. I was a barber. Or knew how to, to do, I mean, uh, actual be an electrician. I mean, I can you know, do some things, of course, but to, to, to have that, that, that skill, that vocational skill, to, to be able to be marketable to do anything, because right now in our society with older people, having, not having the skills that, that uh, young people have, it's difficult. And with, with a, a more information society or information economy and service economy, those things are, are, are least, uh, they're more valued, I should say. Handiwork, being able to use your hands, I'm sorry. But even in the low grades, the middle grades, they're not getting it, even in the middle grades. And, and just as an introduction for them to start to explore, to connect with sciences and uh, engineering and math, certain concepts that they would connect with in the real world, which might help them to understand what they're doing instead of, they say, well, you didn't do well in math, so instead of having one period a day, we're going to ram it down your throat and you're going to have three periods a day. I, I, I hear the, the, the need there, and, I, and as I said, I agree that there's more, there's more vocational and hands-on actual, you know, like they, when I was a kid, you didn't have hands-on museums. You went to the museum, you looked at the thing, and you went home. But now you have hands-on museums for young kids. They need more hands-on experiences in school for kids, whether it's art class or shop class or bake, you know, anybody used to take home ec here? Home ec? Yeah, I mean, you learn how to do those things in school. You had a question? Yes. I have many concerns. The one that bothers me the most is uh, individuals seeking asylum, and the education that they get in while seeking asylum. The Samaya brothers. The marathon, uh, uh, Boston Marathon, they came here as uh, asylees. They got the best education, they got scholarship, food stamp, everything. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? Another thing, the mother was returned, she was deported back to Ukraine because when they abroad. When she applied for the asylum, she stated that she was afraid for her life harassment from the government. But where is she now? She's back in, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, afraid. you when know, when individuals seek asylum, the first thing I want to know, did you try to seek asylum anywhere near your country? Mm -hmm. And if not, why not? And then they can proceed from there. Well, you know, I think that, I think that the issue of asylum is one thing, but this is the general story that you're talking about. I remember when I was a young boy, I went to this place to go buy some pants, or my parents went to buy pants for me, and I kind of like got upset because I didn't get the pants I wanted. And my father took me out of the store and he said, don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's what you should tell those people. Okay. Okay. Just, just, uh, I'm okay, I want to give a nice round of applause for Kevin Barrett. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.